So on to cholesterol and amino acid metabolism. We're going to see how from acetyl-CoA, which came from our fatty acids, we're going to make the molecules of cholesterol and all of its descendant molecules, such as hormones and uh, factors that help you digest lipids, uh, emulsifying agents, and so forth. We're also going to see very briefly, um, not in too much detail, how we synthesize our amino acids from scratch. So let's start with a little chart here about um, heart disease. So on the top right here is a chart I pulled from the CDC that lists the heart disease death rates from uh, 02 to 07 for adults ages over 35. And if you look at the, the color coding, uh, a lot of the darker colors there mean a 112 to twice that uh, annual deaths per 100,000 individuals, and it's centered on the South. Right, so in particular, the entire state of Mississippi. So these numbers don't seem large or small. We have no basis to compare them to, to what's, what's high and what's low. But if you compare that same analysis done a decade later, right, from 2014 to 2016, same analysis, adults 35 plus by county again, and you look at the lowest population here, or the lowest rate here, I know it's a little small, it's hard to see, but the one on the right, the faintest color of red, is still in the 100 to 200 range. So, and that's everywhere on the map. So the highest numbers from 02 to 07 are now the lowest category a decade later. And then of course, the other ones are much, much higher. They're, you know, five to six times higher than that. So, and the same areas predominate. It's, it's mostly in the South. So this is clearly a problem, and it's not getting any better. Uh, the bottom left is a map of uh, cardiovascular disease, so not exactly the same analysis or study, but uh, death rates due to cardiovascular disease per 100,000, and you see it's very disparate across the world. Uh, so in places like the, the U.S., Europe, Australia, the west coast of South America, very low death rates per 100,000 of cardiovascular disease doesn't mean there aren't incidences of cardiovascular disease. It's just we have better health care in those areas. Whereas other areas of the world, we see the darker red colors, the health care is not as common for an individual. So if you have a cardiovascular disease, you're more likely to suffer consequences and less likely to get treatment. So let's talk about how this heart disease and stuff is related to cholesterol. So cholesterol is the molecule associated with all this heart disease. But we must have it. It's vital to our function. We already talked about what it does before and that it modulates that fluidity of the membrane. So it allows the membrane to stay fluid under a wider range of temperatures. We talked about that when we covered lipids. But cholesterol is also the precursor to lots of other things that we need, like steroid-based hormones. Uh, not the protein ones, but steroid-based hormones, uh, such as progesterone, testosterone, estradiol, cortisol, we also make vitamin D from cholesterol. Uh, don't fall into the myth that vitamin D comes from the sun. There's no way molecules of vitamin D are flying through space from the sun to the earth. That's ridiculous. What happens though is cholesterol, the molecule, is affected by the UV light from those incident photons. And it breaks the bond between carbons 9 and 10. Right? And it opens up the, the B ring and then that makes the molecule of vitamin D. So you do need solar radiation to make vitamin D, but it's made from cholesterol. Okay, so it only happens where it's exposed to that light, so of course it happens near the surface of the skin. So if you have a bedridden patient and they don't have access to sunlight, you can put a, a blue lamp, a purple lamp, a black lamp, something that produces a small amount of UV radiation, not a UV lamp, but something that produces a small amount behind their knee for, say, 15 minutes a day. And that'll give you enough exposure to make the vitamin D they need. Okay. So let's see how we make this cholesterol molecule. So it's all going to start with acetyl-CoA. Right? So no sugars involved here, but we're going to start with acetyl-CoA and assemble those into a molecule of mevalinate. Okay, so mevalinate here has six carbons. You can probably guess how many acetyl-CoAs that's going to take. So we make mevalinate, and then from mevalinate, we make an isopentenyl pyrophosphate. That sounds complicated, but it's really not. Isopentenyl means it's got five carbons, it's branched, and it's got a double bond. Right? 
just a straight five carbon chain, so it's four with a methyl group, and it's got a double bond in it. It's also got two phosphates attached in the form of pyrophosphate. I wonder where we're going to get those. All of that takes place in the cytoplasm, and the reason behind that is all those molecules so far are still soluble in water. And uh, in particular because of the phosphates on it here, right, in the end. So it's still soluble in water. All this is going to take place in the cytoplasm by soluble enzymes. The next stage is taking those isopentanyl pyrophosphates and condensing them to a long chain. So we're going to put six of those five carbon molecules together into a very small polymer. Right? It's not a ridiculously long polymer like you would make in an organic lab, but it's a very similar reaction. Uh, you can tell the phosphate, the pyrophosphates are going to be excellent leaving groups, and it's going to make a molecule called squalene. And squalene has a grand total of 30 carbons. Right? So I'm putting six five carbon molecules together, I'll have 30 carbons. There aren't 30 in a row, right? It's, it's six four carbon molecules in a row with methyl group on each one. So it's not going to be 30 carbons long, it's only going to be 24, it's going to have six methyl groups on it. All right, this occurs in the ER, and why does it occur here? Well, I'm losing the pyrophosphates at this point, which is really the only thing making it soluble because the rest is all hydrocarbon. And when I lose those to condense it into this longer squalene molecule, it will no longer be soluble in water. So this occurs where it gets the isopentanyl pyrophosphates from the cytoplasm, and at the surface of the ER membrane, right, we're going to make this squalene. Of course, it will then be deposited into the membrane. And why the ER membrane and not any other membrane? Because I'd like to be able to move it to wherever I need it, either export it to the cell surface, put it in other vesicles, send it to the nuclear membrane, wherever I need the cholesterol, I can export it from here. Okay, so from squalene, the rest of the part's rather simple. We're not going to do much more of a complication in here. We're just going to cyclize the squalene. We'll introduce all those rings that you saw in cholesterol, the four A, B, C, D rings, those fused rings. And that happens in a series of steps, which you won't go into too much detail on. But you, uh, I'll give you an idea how they're put together with the drawing. And we end up with our cholesterol molecule. A few carbons are removed. In fact, three methyl groups are removed. So we go from 30 carbons down to 27, and that's our cholesterol molecule. The cholesterol has some modifications done on it, of course. We're going to get that OH at carbon number three. We get the long tail on the end, which may become a carboxyl group, depending on what we're going to turn the cholesterol into. Right? But the core has our 17 carbons, which you know how to draw a number. And then there's some jewelry on those 17 carbons. There's 10 more carbons in that tail structure and methyl groups. Of course, this also occurs in the ER because it's, once again, still not soluble in water. All right, so let's start from the beginning with acetyl-CoA. And this is something you've seen before. Right? So the part drawn in blue here with the blue box around it, and also labeled the steps, you've seen this before, and you should think back to when you saw this. Compare this to other pathways we've looked at, and it should look familiar. Right? So in the beginning, you see there's two acetyl-CoA molecules sitting there. So here's showing the S of the CoA this time. Right? So two acetyl-CoAs interact. One has a nucleophilic attack on the other. Again, we saw this once before. We're going to get uh, a deprotonation event on the methyl group. It attacks the carbonyl and we lose the CoA and we end up with acetoacetyl-CoA. Okay. A third acetyl-CoA comes in. We have a similar attack again on the same carbonyl, except this time the OH that forms, or the O- that forms, becomes an OH. It doesn't collapse to a carbonyl, and we lose yet another CoA. It was at this point where we diverge from that other pathway, where we were making those ketone bodies or making the fatty acids, and we have this HMG-CoA, and I said it stood for 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-glutaryl-CoA. Well, glutaryl just means five carbons with a carboxyl on each end. So that's what glutaryl stands for, like glutamate and glutamine. Both are that type. One has an amino group, of course. But HM stands for the hydroxy and the methyl that are both on carbon number three there. Okay, so we can abbreviate this 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-glutaryl-CoA as just hmg Right? And we've made it up to this point in prior pathways, but here's where we're going to diverge from those pathways. This is the important key step. It's the irreversible step. It's the one that commits you to making cholesterol. Right? So this is the committed step to making cholesterol, and if you want to limit the production of cholesterol, this is the enzyme you want to target. 
the one that converts this HMG CoA to the next molecule, mevalonate. Okay, so what's happening here? We're taking HMG CoA, we're clearly losing the CoA, if you look at the structures, and we're also taking the carboxyl group that was at the connection between the HMG and the CoA and reducing it from a carboxyl to an aldehyde to a primary alcohol. So that's going to be two reduction events. That's why it's two NADPHs there. So we're cutting off the CoA, and at the very same time, because it's a thioester bond, it's readily, easily to break, and we're going to reduce the remaining molecule twice to a primary alcohol. Of course, that rearranges some of our priorities in the molecule. Carbon number one technically would be on the other end now, but the hydroxy and the methyl are still on number three. Okay, so this is called mevalonate. It's not a sugar, right? It's not a lipid. It's just a metabolite used in making cholesterol. Okay? This is its only purpose. If we turn HMG-CoA into mevalonate, we are destined to make cholesterol from this. Okay? I drew mevalonate again on the bottom left of the figure. From here, we're going to do several things. In fact, we'll do three reactions, each requiring ATP, um, two of them incorporating a phosphate onto the molecule, the other just powering it, and we're also going to lose the CO2 on the end. Okay, so we're going to lose that other carbon. So we go from having five carbons, right, the HMG-CoA having five in a row plus its methyl group, so a total of six, to mevalonate, again, five in a row and a methyl group. We're going to lose that CO2 on the end, the carboxyl group, so we'll only have four in a row for the methyl group. Still has a total of five carbons, but we're down to a four carbon chain. Okay, and this is called isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Okay, the, the number of carbons is still there. The only thing we lost was the CO2. And it's called iso because it's not a straight chain. It's an isomer of it. It's branched. And it's not a pentane. It's a pentene because we've introduced a vinyl group on there, that double bond. Okay, this molecule is still soluble in water. And it has, is, resembles or has the appearance of an isoprene group. And I drew an isoprene on the, the right there for you. So an isoprene group, if you remember from maybe when you studied uh, polymers in organic chemistry, is something that can react with itself, a series of these in itself. And you propagate all the double bonds into single bonds and you make really long chains. right? You probably made some, some polymers in lab like that. And uh, trees do this all the time. Plants make polymers out of isoprene units all the time. But in this case, it's not exactly an isoprene where one double bond shifts to the middle and the other reaches out and grabs the next chain. Here, our double bonds are going to shift and we have a leaving group. This pyrophosphate is a great leaving group, which of course can get subsequently hydrolyzed to drive it forward. And it leaves behind a great nucleophile, right? That CH2 is going to be a great nucleophile with its negative charge to attack the next carbon. Okay, so it's like the polymerization of isoprenes, but the slight twist. We're going to have a good leaving group instead. Okay, so it's very important that you know this pathway. The first part boxed in blue there is what we've seen before when we're making other things. Then we had HMG-CoA reductase. It's the unique enzyme to this pathway. We're going to lose the CoA and we're going to reduce the end of that molecule twice down to a primary alcohol. Okay, why do we need an alcohol? We need a place to put the phosphates. Right? We can't put them on that 3OH, we're going to put them here. Okay, so we're going to lose, lose the carboxyl group. We're going to phosphorylate it twice. The other ATP is the power uh, moving the double bond. And we're going to end up with this 3-isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Okay? What do we do from here? We're going to take six of these isopentanyl pyrophosphates, each containing five carbons, and put them together. Okay, so I'm going to take these six isopentanyl pyrophosphates, and put them, together, put them together two different ways. So if I take two isopentanyl pyrophosphates and hook them head to tail, whichever end you want to call head, whichever end you want to call tail. All right, let's call the, the, where the double bond is the head and where the phosphates are the tail. So if I hook two of these head to tail, I'll end up with the structure you see on the bottom left. All right, so if I take one shown in black here, another shown in red, and I hook them head to tail, right, the, the head of this one with the tail of the next one, I lose the pyrophosphate in between, I'll make a new carbon-carbon bond. Okay? I do that one more time. I take the, the farnesyl that I've made, the, the 10 carbon thing, plus another isopentanyl pyrophosphate, lose the pyrophosphate once more, 
and now I've hooked three of them head to tail. So I have a 15 card piece. So I've played my head to tail connection game twice. I put two of these isopentineals together to make a farnesyl, and I put one of those and one more isopentineal to make the 15 carbon. Okay, and I do that whole process one more time to make it yet another 15 carbon piece. Again, I'll hook head to tail. And then in the last step, I take two of the 15 carbon ones and hook them head to head or tail to tail, whichever you described as head or tail. But now I'm putting them head to head or tail to tail, right? And I make this squalene molecule. And as you can tell, squalene is nothing but hydrocarbon. It's got six double bonds in it, and it's got six methyl groups that are not in the main chain, but it's just a hydrocarbon. It's not going to be soluble in water. And it's rather long and flexible, right? And all these bonds except the double bonds are free to rotate. So we can arrange this molecule into different shapes, and we have several enzymes that will shape this molecule into what you see here. So same molecule shown on the left that we had before, right? and I've rearranged it so you can see where the rings are forming. Right, you see the A ring is going to form here, and the B ring here, and the C ring here, and the D ring is forming here. And the last piece here will become the tail. Right, so there's a series of steps that help the cyclization happen. There's a, a bunch of enzymes involved. We're not going to go over all of them. And you end up with our steroid core here. Right, and along the way, we also remove three methyl groups, right? one of them here at uh, 14, and then two of them down here at number four. Right, so I pointed those out. So we have our cholesterol, some double bonds get rearranged, of course, and then we add our hydroxy group, and we have cholesterol. And what I want you to remember in that process is what's made from what, how is it powered, where the bonds go. How much does it cost me to make this? Let's back up and add it up. Let's go back to where we started. What is it going to cost me to make a cholesterol? Well, every acetyl-CoA I use isn't technically an ATP, but it has the potential through the citric acid cycle and electron transport chain to make 10 ATP, right? And I'm using three of those to make HMG-CoA, right? So that's my six carbons there come from three acetyl-CoA's. That's a potential of 30 ATP that I'm investing into this, not directly, but it's 30 ATP I will not get because I'm spending those three acetyl-CoA's to make this. So, so far, this is quite expensive. It's about as expensive as a glucose just at this point. Right? But then we do NADPH to reduce this molecule to mevalinate. Each NADPH is equivalently worth the amount as, of ATP as an NADH, so about 2.5 ATPs each. So this is yet another 5 ATP that I could be getting that I'm investing in this molecule. So mevalinate alone is an investment of 35 ATP, or 35 potential ATP. Okay, so sounds fairly expensive so far. And then for each mevalinate, I'm going to spend three more ATP directly, right? I'm actually spending them here, to make the isopentaneal pyrophosphate. So that's 38 ATP to arrive here. And then of course you can do the math from here. I'm going to take six of those and combine them to make a squalene. And it doesn't cost anything after this, but squalene can cyclize into cholesterol, and we remove some methyl groups and so forth. But you calculate how much that costs, and you'll come to the conclusion that cholesterol is a rather expensive molecule, directly and indirectly, to synthesize. So we must need it. So not all the time do you want to make cholesterol, clearly. It's a huge investment of energy and resources. And if you don't need it made right now, let's not do the, the step that commits me to it. Right? I can make HMG-CoA, that's 30 ATP potential invested, but use it for other things if I need to. But if I go past that step and do HMG-CoA reductase, I'm destined to make cholesterol. I must finish it or it's wasteful. Right? So if you don't want to make cholesterol, it makes sense I should regulate it at that first irreversible or committed step. We've seen that many times in many pathways. Okay. So how do we regulate an enzyme? Well, we regulate it at multiple levels. Right? The cell has four different levels in which it regulates it, and as humans, we've come up with a fifth to help us regulate our production of cholesterol. So the first way you can regulate an enzyme is don't make it. Don't even make the mRNA that codes for it. 
So at the level of transcription, we can say, don't make this message, right? So cholesterol itself, the molecule, acts as a transcriptional regulator. We've already talked about how, if you think back to one of our earlier lectures, how regulatory elements like sterols, we did estradiol as an example, but cholesterol is another, can bind to certain proteins, they go down to the nucleus, they bind to DNA, and they act as transcription factors. In this case, it acts to turn the, the transcription of the mRNA off. We have enough cholesterol, if it's doing this, don't make the ability to make more. So cholesterol itself binds to a, a sterol regulatory element. We talked about those back in the first exam. And it turns off the production of the HMG-CoA reductases mRNA. So we're controlling it at the transcriptional level. But does it turn it off completely? Of course not. We will always make a few of those molecules, right? Just not going to make a lot of them in the presence of cholesterol. So it'll make a few of those mRNAs. So the cell says, well, if you made a few of those and I still don't want it to happen, I don't need to make any more, let's shut this process down at the translational level. So cholesterol can bind to a couple of proteins, and they also recognize the HMG-CoA reductase mRNA by its secondary structure, because you remember mRNA can fold, right, form double-stranded regions and hairpin loops and stuff like that. So that particular sequence folds a certain way, and cholesterol, when bound to a certain set of proteins, recognizes that and will not let it go to the ribosome. It will not let it unfold and go through the ribosome as a message. So we're shutting it down now, even more so, at the translational level. So for the few that were transcribed, we don't let them go through translation. But some are going to leak through. It's occasionally one will get through and will make the protein. Right? We'll make the HMG-CoA reductase. So the cell says, okay, we've got another level of control. I've made this protein, I really didn't want to, so let's just turn it off. We have allosteric control, right? So we can, we can have cholesterol bind to it, right? Which promotes a phosphorylation. And phosphorylation will cause the enzyme to reduce its activity. This is another one of those weird ones where normally phosphorylating something will activate it. Here, we phosphorylate it and we decrease its activity, much like our glycogen synthase was. Okay, so we turn down the enzyme. Even the very few that were transcribed and the very few that were produced as protein, we now turn down their activity. We regulate them and reduce their activity by phosphorylation. But even then, it's not turned off. So the cell really has it in for not making cholesterol when we don't need it because of the expense involved. So now if there's lots of cholesterol around, it also activates other proteins that are digestive enzymes specific for the reductase. So if we can't turn it off, we can't turn off its mRNA production completely, we can't turn off the protein production completely, we can't inhibit it to turn it off completely with phosphorylation, how about we just degrade the thing? So cholesterol binding some proteases are very specific for this reductase and they degrade the enzyme. Well, of course at this point you have to say to yourself there's very little chance of making the HMG into mevalinate, HMG-CoA into mevalinate, with all this inhibitory regulation. But for humans, it wasn't enough. We really want to shut this thing down. So we've come up with drugs, right? So these statin drugs act as competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase. So we have a fifth level of control that we've introduced artificially, really don't make this thing. And so I, I tried to color code these somehow so you can remember each one's at a different level of control. We have transcriptional control, don't make the mRNA. We have translational control, don't turn it into a protein, right? Don't make the enzyme. We have regulation by phosphorylation. It's also allosteric control because the cholesterol must also bind. And that shuts the enzyme down, not completely, but lowers its activity. And then if that's not enough, excess cholesterol will activate proteases that will degrade that enzyme, right? And then as humans, we've, of course, introduced an external molecule, an artificial molecule that's a competitive inhibitor of this enzyme. So we clearly don't want to make cholesterol unless it's absolutely needed. But it is needed by all cells, but we don't want too much. Okay, moving on to another protein. Uh, cholesterol is... A molecule that we just made we saw it was very uh, lipid soluble very not very water soluble at all it was just hydrocarbons there's one rare OH it gets attached but this thing is so large 27 carbons 
there's no way it's soluble in water. Right? We also have all these fatty acids that we were talking about earlier that we can make from acetyl-CoA. So our products of acetyl-CoA, cholesterol and our fatty acids, need to be able to, to move around the body from one cell to another. And we can't let them float in the blood because they don't, right? They're not soluble. So we need some way to move them throughout the organism. So we introduce proteins called lipoproteins, and they're basically taxis very specific for lipids, right? They carry lipids around. And the two main cargo that they carry are going to be the triacylglycerols, which are made from the lipids, of course, plus glycerol, from the fatty acids, plus glycerol, and cholesterol. They do carry lots of other things, but these are the main two I want you to focus on. Okay, so up here at the top, I have a little table for you, and I've, I've boxed in the things that are, are really important, and I've left out the others. So the, the five things on the left, the five different lipoproteins we're going to talk about, one I really don't need you to know. Right, so the top one is called chylomicrons, right, and they are the, the least dense of the group. The densities are very, very subtly different, but they are the least dense. And then there's very low-density lipoproteins, VLDLs. And the two at the bottom are called low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, and high-density lipoproteins, HDLs. And by high, I don't mean much higher than the others. It's just that's their order. That intermediate-density lipoprotein, or IDLs, we're going to ignore. Although they do carry lipids around, they're, they're really just a precursor for making the LDLs. They're just not a completely synthesized LDL yet. So we're just going to ignore them as a precursor. All right, so focus on the other two. Uh, pairs and they separate rather well in what they carry as cargo. So the chylomicrons at the very top and the VLDLs right underneath it, the two least dense of them, mainly carry triacylglycerols. Right? You look at their percentages over there, by far they carry mostly triacylglycerols. Right? The LDLs and HDLs carry mostly cholesterol. And cholesterol is often found as a cholesterol ester. It's esterified to some, some fatty acid or some other carboxyl group. But you see C and CE there, the cholesterol and the cholesterol esters combined, is the bulk of their cargo. Okay. Now they do carry other things like phospholipids and triacylglycerols, but I want you to focus on mainly the things I've boxed. Chylomicrons and VLDLs carry triacylglycerols for me. That's their primary occupation. LDLs and HDLs, their primary job is to carry cholesterol and cholesterol descendants or esters. Okay, so think those two different categories. Okay? Now we have to decide from where and to where are they carrying things. So the chylomicrons and the VLDLs both carry triacylglycerols. That's their job. The chylomicrons pick them up from where they're ingested, so it goes in the body, through the mouth, through the stomach, to the small intestine, and the small intestine capillaries there, the, the outside of the, the intestinal cells, so you absorb the nutrients from the lumen, it goes filtered through the cells, and on the back side of the small intestine cells are the, all the capillaries leading from there. These are where the chylomicrons are, right? They pick up all these triacylglycerols from the small intestine cell, from the back door of the small intestine cell, right? Not the front facing the intestine, but the back side facing the blood. It picks all those up and it needs to carry them downstream. So downstream from there leads always to the same place. Any blood vessel leaving the small intestine always goes to the same place. They coalesce into the hepatic portal vein, end up at the liver. So anything you eat has to go through customs. Makes sense. It's a filtering system for the body in case you eat something that shouldn't be there. Right? You don't want it injected directly into the blood. So chylomicrons carry the triacylglycerols from the small intestine capillaries through the hepatic portal system to the liver. And they drop them off at the liver. Their job is done. That's as far as they go. Now for the chylomicrons, think of them as taxis, like, you know, like at the airport. right? So think of them as, as they need to go back to the small intestine, to the, the blood vessels of the small intestine, to get more triacylglycerols. But you can't go backwards through this road system. right? You don't go backwards through the blood. There's no way. But you also don't want to go forward through the blood and go through the entire rest of the body circulation because there's a very small chance you'll end up back where you need to go. So they get off the main highway and the chylomicrons take the surface streets, right? There's another vesicular system that leads back there and it's the lymphatic system, right? So they'll take the lymphatic system from the liver, 
which is a very low pressure, low volume, very slow, back to the intestinal cells of the small intestine to pick up more triacylglycerols. So chylomicrons are picking up triacylglycerols, bringing it to the liver through the blood, then hopping on the lymphatic system to get back to the small intestine cells. And that's their entire role. They never leave that circulation. If you find chylomicrons outside of that in the general circulation, we have one of two problems. One's bad, one's really bad. So if you find them outside of that, you may have some liver damage because they're not being picked up by the liver and sent back through the lymphatics. They're getting by that system. Okay, so you may have some liver damage. Alcoholics tend to have this if they're on the, onto the cirrhosis stage. Right? The other problem, which is much, much worse, is if you find chylomicrons in abundance in the general circulation, the cells that are making them have migrated from where they started to somewhere else outside of that hepatic circulation. That's a tumor cell. Right? It's, it's metastasized somewhere else. So now you have cancer. So that's a much worse option than just alcoholism. Okay? So what about these triacylglycerols? They've been dropped off at the liver. Now they need to be picked up from the liver and transported out to the rest of the body, mostly to adipose cells or rapidly dividing cells that need more fatty acids. So that's where our VLDLs come in. They pick up the cargo from the liver and bring it out to the rest of the body, mostly to adipose cells or to other rapidly dividing cells. And so you see they carry other things as well, but mainly triacylglycerol. So think of it as a relay race with these two. Chylomicrons transport it first from the diet, from the small intestine, to the liver, and then VLDLs pick it up from there and bring it from the liver out to the rest of the body that needs it. So it's a two-part relay race. The other two, LDLs and HDLs, carry mostly cholesterol. Well, we got to think, where is cholesterol coming from? And I don't mean in the diet. I mean, where do we get cholesterol? Where is it synthesized? Mostly in liver cells. Right? The liver is the main factory for making cholesterol, the process we just talked about. So it's made in the liver. It's stored in the, the gallbladder for the digestive enzyme part, or digestive emulsifying agent part of it. But also we need to send cholesterol made by the liver to other cells in the body as well. We don't need them all making it themselves. Let the liver do it. So LDLs, the low-density lipoproteins, are responsible for transporting cholesterol from the liver out to the rest of the body, again, mostly to adipose cells. Okay? We need a way to get back to the liver, because what if there's too much? So high-density lipoproteins do the opposite. They pick it up from whatever cells have excess, and bring it back to the liver. All of that takes place in the bloodstream. Okay, so these are all carriers that carry fat soluble things, but because of the protein presence, it becomes soluble in the blood. Okay, if you look at the bottom right, you see a picture of one. Here's an LDL there. And you notice the protein doesn't constitute much of the, the particle. Right? It's mostly a, a protein with a lot of lipid sequestered away inside. But it's not a sealed sphere. It's not a, a sealed chamber. It's exposed to the outside. So these aren't very good taxis. The LDLs are more like rickshaws. Right? If you're riding in one of these and you're a cholesterol molecule and you're not esterified, you're likely to fall out. Right? And they fall out all the time. Right? If you're a cholesterol molecule and you fall out of the bloodstream, you don't pick yourself up and try to get another ride. You're roadkill because right? you're not soluble in water. You just follow along the... the lining of the artery or vein, mostly in the arteries, and you just become a plaque. Okay? Whereas HDLs, since they're higher density, means there's more protein present. Right, the, the amount of the protein that is there is larger. If you look at the composition chart up there, you see it's more protein than LDLs are. So it's a little more sealed of a, a carrier. It's a better taxi. You don't fall out as often. Okay, so. A lot of people will term these good and bad cholesterol. In fact, they're not cholesterol at all. They're proteins, but they do carry cholesterol, so I guess that's okay. But neither is good nor bad. You need both of them to function. The idea here is to have them in the right amounts. So you obviously need more LDLs than HDLs because you, it's just like any good company. You export your product to other cells far more often than they send it back as a return. Right? So there's plenty more export of cholesterol from the liver than there are cells sending excess back to the liver. So there are way more LDLs than HDLs. For a healthy person, that's roughly a 3 or 4 to 1 ratio. Okay? But if you have high cholesterol, as they like to call it, 
the LDL to HDL ratio might be something like 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, right? And when it's up for 20 to 1, you're making way too much cholesterol and there's way too much in the body that the liver can't store it anymore. So number one, you should stop eating so much cholesterol and maybe get on one of those statin drugs, which will decrease the production of cholesterol. Right? The, the taxis are trying to keep up with the, the number of, of patrons who want to ride in them. And of course, there would be more LDLs than HDLs. If that ratio gets above four or five, then you're in the trouble of having high cholesterol. So when they're measuring these things, they're measuring the, product, the, the concentration of these proteins in your blood, right? the carriers. And they measure the carriers in both LDLs and HDLs. Okay, so here's a picture on the top right of a pair of blood vessels. The panel labeled A is, well, not anymore. It's a slide that's been cut open. But and at one point, it was a functioning artery with an open center. right? The center part is now, you know, all fixed and everything, but blood would be able to flow through that center part, right, all the interior area. And in B, you see the, the opening is, is much smaller, right, where you see the red blood cells in there from this picture. But you see all that greasy looking orange stuff, that's cholesterol and other lipids that have deposited in this vesicle. Right, so which artery do you guys think this is? What's the number one artery for this to happen? The aorta. Not the aorta. This is not the aorta. Carotid. Carotid. Um, no, good guess. It sounds like carotid, but it's not carotid. Oh, oh coronary. It's the coronary artery, right? So the coronary arteries are the ones that, that perfuse the outside of the heart, right? Not the interior, but the exterior muscle of the heart, right? So if you were writing in an LDL rickshaw, right? It's loaded with cholesterol. You're one of 6,000 passengers in this little cart, right? And when are you most likely to fall out? Let's, let's put it in a real world scenario. Like you're driving on the road, or you're not driving, you're being pulled down the road. Under what scenarios on the road are you most likely to fall out of this thing? Well, let's, go ahead. You make a turn or something. You make a sharp turn, one more, one more feature. That's correct, sharp turn at High speed? Like high, at high speed, exactly. So this, if you're familiar with Atlanta, this is the uh, the connection where you turn from 75 onto 85, or sorry, 85 onto 75. And if you don't obey that speed limit sign, you're going to be up on that grassy knoll with all the other car parts. So you can think of all those parts when you drive by there next time as the cholesterol molecules that are being tossed out of this rickshaw. I'm uh, mixing analogies now. So high speed turns are very dangerous for these molecules, these carriers. So where in the body would we have a high speed, basically U-turn? Well, as the aorta is, is coming out of the top of the heart, that's the highest pressure, the highest speed you're gonna see for these molecules. And the first vessels to come off the aorta are the coronaries, right? They go from a big aorta, relatively speaking, to a very small vessel, and it's nearly a 90 or 180 degree turn at very high speeds. This is where they're going to fall out. Right? So this is why you have your plaques forming mostly in the coronary arteries. And that's dangerous because they feed the heart. Right? So you're, you're at risk for a, a, a heart attack. Okay? So the molecules on the bottom, lovastatin, is our HMG-CoA reductase competitive inhibitor. And I want to make a point here that it doesn't really look like HMG-CoA. It doesn't really look like cholesterol. It doesn't really resemble either one, but it's got some features of both. Right? And it's a competitive inhibitor, not because it looks like anything else. That's not the definition, if you remember. But when this binds, HMG-CoA cannot bind. That's the idea. Okay? The other part of HMG-CoA reductase, besides the HMG part of it, remember we also have to bind a, a molecule of NADPH. Right? And this bottom part of this lovastatin resembles the flavin ring of NADPH except it can't be used as a substrate. Right, so this binds in place of one or both of the substrates, right, and it prevents the reaction from happening. But it is dissociable, right? It's, it's a reversible inhibitor. So you don't need a lot of it. You don't have to keep taking it. It's not consumed. I mean, you do have to keep taking it, but not as much as a, an irreversible inhibitor. 
All right, so from cholesterol, what can we make? All right, so I said we make a lot of things. Uh, one of the ones we're going to talk about are our bile salts. So this is an example at the bottom of our bile salt. It's called glycocholate. I know that looks like chocolate. Now all of you are thinking about chocolate. But in fact, this molecule will help you digest the lipids in chocolate, right? Although it is not chocolate in and of itself. So cholesterol was made by the liver. It's, it's transported to the gallbladder, right, as for storage. And then it's going to be released into the small intestine when we have that cholecystokinin signal. If you go back to the cell signaling lecture, you'll see when you eat lipids, we have that signal to release this along with the bicarbonate. So what do we do to our cholesterol molecule? So I know you don't know how to draw the whole thing, but you clearly recognize the, the four fused rings of the core. And that OH down there on the bottom left on number three was already there. But there's some new additions here. The two other OHs are brand new, so we've added those to it. Does that make it water soluble? No, but it makes it a little more water friendly. Right? And then the tail, right? this long tail of cholesterol, ignore the blue part for a second, but the long black tail of cholesterol has been oxidized to form a carboxylic acid. Right? So without this blue part here, this would be a carboxylic acid, and that's why it's called cholate. Right? So cholesterol, here's the OH that makes it cholesterol, but the other end, if I turn it into a carboxyl group, is called a cholate now. And of course, a cholate would be the conjugate base of a cholic acid, and I've attached it to something else. What is this blue thing I've attached? I believe we talked about this once. It's, it's glycine, right. So that's one of your amino acids, that's glycine. And glycine's been attached through its amino end to a carboxyl group of cholesterol, of cholic acid, and it forms this new amide bond. So it's a glycocholate. Glyco normally stands for sugar. We can also mean glycine when we say that. So this is a glycocholic acid combination, so glycocholate. And because of all this addition of this end looks rather water soluble, these three OHs make the other end not so water insoluble as it was, so it's kind of got some features of both. That's a great molecule for being a detergent or an emulsifying agent, and that's exactly its role. So it can interact with the lipids that you eat in your diet and allow them to emulsify with all the other water-soluble digestive enzymes around, right? the lipases and the, the other molecules that can destroy our lipids, and of course this one gets destroyed along with them but it allows me to increase the surface area dramatically. So if you have your gallbladder removed and you can't store this glycocholate for when you eat that cheesecake, then the cheesecake can't be digested as well. It's much slower because the surface area is much less and the cheesecake goes right through you, right? So be careful what you eat if you have your gallbladder removed. Okay. What else do we make from cholesterol? Well, our steroid hormones. And I don't need you to memorize these, these structures on the right, but I do need you to tell them apart. Right? So if you look at these, they're rather easy to tell apart. So if I gave you the molecule testosterone, and you just looked at the ending purely from a chemical word point of view, what does testosterone indicate? Ketone. ketone. Ketone, exactly. And that's exactly what we have. We have a ketone on number three. The all-important number three with its OH is now a carbonyl. Right? So this is testosterone. If we called it estradiol, what does the diol indicate? Well, there's two hydroxy groups. And they're exactly where you'd expect, on number three and on the polar opposite end of the molecule, number 17, just where this one was. So if it's got two OHs, estradiol. If it's got a ketone in one of them, testosterone. Now if I modify the other end and make it also a ketone, right? so there's a ketone on both ends, that's progesterone. Okay? Now that name isn't as obvious, it also says own, so you know it's a, a ketone, but it has two of them. So just looking at that alone, you can tell these apart. Testosterone, one ketone, estradiol, two alls, right? two hydroxies, and progesterone as two ketones. Okay? The molecule at the bottom is a synthetic molecule, it's a drug, right? and it's meant to mimic one of the molecules above it. Which molecule does it seem to mimic? Progesterone. Progesterone, right? I sometimes get testosterone for that one because it does have an OH over there, that's true. But because of that, that triple bonded group there, right, it resembles 
progesterone more likely, right, in shape, because it's got an extra extra carbon sticking out there. But because it's carbon and not oxygen, it's not a carbonyl, and it doesn't interact with the the receptor exactly the same way. It does tell the receptor that something like progesterone is pregnant is present, right? That's a Freudian slip. Something like progesterone is present, but it is not progesterone, and it persists. It's not destroyed like progesterone is. So progesterone is produced by the ovaries to tell the body that you're pregnant, right? Let's continue gestation, progestation. That's why it's called progesterone. But if you give this synthetic drug at the bottom, synthetic progestin, then it tricks the body into thinking you're pregnant and it doesn't produce the estradiol and you don't get the ovum development. That's the idea. But you can't stay on this permanently. If you have a physician who's prescribing you the same contraceptive year after year after year after year for decades, you're in trouble because your body will get used to the signal and goes, you're pregnant, you're pregnant. And your body will just go, we get it, just shut the ovaries down. And you'll eventually have degradation of those tissues. So you have to change it up occasionally. Usually it's two years or four years or six years, depending on the drug, they vary. But you should change them because at some point you may want to have children. And so that's why it's, physicians are very hesitant to give uh, women who are in their teens and 20s because even if you say you don't want children now, you might change your mind in 10 years, uh, to give them a drug that will cause permanent damage to an ovary. Okay, so I don't want you to memorize these molecules, but I do want you to be able to tell these four apart. And it's pretty obvious that that big group at the bottom is different from the others. It's not even a carbonyl, right? It's a triple bonded carbon. Okay, so shifting gears real quick to talk about amino acid synthesis. Uh, this one is not going to be as in-depth as I, I could cover amino acid synthesis because we just don't have the time in this course. But we go over the basics. And I'm sure you remember what amino acids are. Just to review real quick, they have a, a carboxyl group and an amino group, right? Both on the same. Number two are alpha carbon. And on the alpha carbon is also a hydrogen and something called an R group. And the R group is what varies among our 20 common amino acids, right? And if we want to throw in number 21, selenocysteine, because we're going to talk about it too, there's 21 common amino acids. So of these amino acids, what part of it have we definitely left out of our discussion the entire semester? We've talked about a lot of things in this course, but there's one element we've totally neglected. So what part of the amino acid have we never talked about its origin? The amino group. The amino group or the nitrogen, right? So. We've never discussed where the nitrogen comes from. We've had almost no nitrogen in any of our molecules we've really talked about, except a few in the vitamins here and there, like in NAD and FAD. But we've never talked about what we do with amino groups. Where do they come from? They certainly don't come from sugars. They certainly don't come from fats. None of these molecules we eat have amino groups in it. And the nucleic acids do. They're loaded in nitrogen. But we'd rather keep them as they are. Why synthesize them anew when they're already made? So where do we get nitrogen? Well, we mostly get it from proteins, from amino acids that we eat. Now, that doesn't go for the case for plants because they don't eat anything, right, for most plants. So they need to get it from the atmosphere. The N2, which makes up roughly 79% of the atmosphere, is very inert, right? It's two nitrogen atoms that are triple bonded. It's a very stable, nonpolar molecule. It doesn't interact with pretty much anything. But in order to do this, we need to take that very stable, completely oxidized N2, diatomic nitrogen, and turn it into a more reduced form, like an amino group, or ammonia, or ammonium ion, right? So we need some, some energy to do that. So we need to do some reduction. We turn the N2 into ammonia. That's a very difficult reduction to do. Right? To give you an idea how difficult it is, think about the opposite process. You can turn ammonia or ammonium salts into N2, like turning fertilizer into N2, and that could happen explosively. Right? There's a lot of energy released when you turn that NH3 or NH4 plus into um, or N2, 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 diatomic nitrogen, sorry. So the, a lot of fertilizers can be used as, as explosives and a lot of um, 
fuels have nitrogen and oxygen in them and a release N2 is a great byproduct. So they're explosively containing a lot of energy. So to turn N2 into ammonia is going to require an input of energy. Right? It's going to require quite a bit of energy. And it's not an easy reaction. So let's see how we do that. But once we have it at ammonia or NH3 or NH4 plus an ammonium ion, then I can simply play hot potato with the ammonium. I'm going to give it first to glutamate. That's always who gets it first. Glutamate becomes glutamine when I give it the ammonium ion. And it basically just passes it along to all the other molecules that might need it. And we'll talk about that reaction too. So to simplify our amino acid synthesis lecture here, I want to focus on where do we get the nitrogen, right? From N2, the reaction that turns it into ammonia. And then where does the ammonia go? It goes on glutamate first. And then glutamate passes it around to the other amino acids. How does it do that? And then the other amino acids, where do they get their other parts? Other than the nitrogen, what about their other parts? Where do they come from? And you'll see that they all come from a molecule in intermediary metabolism, mostly from citric acid cycle, glycolysis, and a few others. Okay, so let's look at where this comes from. We're going to start with N2 in the atmosphere. And in order for it to be turned into ammonia, NH3, it needs to have some reducing equivalents added to it. So some electrons need to be added. The protons are going to go along for the ride, but I need to add some electrons. From whom could I get the electrons in plants? Well, plants produce a lot of electrons, right? We had the whole photosynthesis cascade. We extract electrons from water. We pass them along from photosystem 2, on to photosystem 1, eventually to ferrodoxin and NADPH, right? Or NADP plus to make NADPH. So we could get them directly from ferrodoxin here. And the organisms that are doing this are not the plants themselves. Go back to that picture for you. They're not the plants themselves, but around the roots or in the roots of these plants, inside the cells, are other little obligate intracellular organisms, right? They can't live free living outside very long, but they live inside the root nodules of these plants. They're not quite an organelle, but they're not quite a free living organism. They're sort of like a parasite, but they do give something back. If we wait another you know, billion years, perhaps, they will be the next organelle inside the plant. Okay, and at that point, the plants will be able to leave the soil and be floating around in the atmosphere or whatever they want to do. But right now, they're tied to the soil because they need nutrients from it and they need these little bacteria that live inside their cells there. Right? So they're culturing them inside their own cells. Not quite another organelle yet. Okay, so those things have a unique enzyme called nitrogenase. The plant doesn't code for it, but these, these little bacteria, bacteria-like things that are living inside code for an enzyme called nitrogenase, and it's critical to life on the planet. So it takes electrons that the plant provides from ferrodoxin, right, and reduces uh, an iron in there from being plus three to plus two. So a ferric iron becomes a ferrous iron, right? It's gaining those electrons. Eventually, those electrons are passed along to the nitrogenase enzyme itself, and it has a very exotic, I would say, metal complex there. It's a molybdenum iron complex. So molybdenum, molybdenum is one of your transition metals. That's not one you would regularly talk about. But it's the only metal that's able to do this efficiently. So it's a molybdenum iron cluster that takes those electrons and transfers them to the nitrogen of N2 to make ammonia. Okay? So these rhizobia, the bacteria that live in the plant root nodules, allow this to happen. So they take in N2 from the atmosphere, which permeates the soil, and they turn it into ammonia for the plant. The plant's going to provide the ATP and the ferrodoxin and the electrons to do this, but the nitrogenase is coded for by these rhizobia bacteria. One day there will be another uh, organelle inside the plant. Okay, so once we have ammonia, what do we do with it? Well, ammonia itself is a very strong base, or rather strong base, and it's going to be protonated right away to ammonium ion, shown on the bottom left. And ammonium ion is going to combine with alpha ketoglutarate to become glutamate. And remember, glute means five. So alpha ketoglutarate has five carbons, which you already knew that. And it's an alpha keto group, which you already knew that too. All right, so alpha ketoglutarate should be able, you could draw it just from the name alone. It's five carbons, a carboxyl on each end, and it's an alpha keto, keto on number two. Okay, so we're going to use ammonia and alpha ketoglutarate, combine them, do that reaction, and put the amino group in place of the alpha keto carbonyl. 
you notice the, the keto group is gone. Right? Where did it go? Well, it left as water. So we need a reducing equivalent to turn that oxygen into water, and at the same time, put the nitrogen onto that carbon. Okay, so we're going to turn alpha ketoglutarate into glutamate. Right? And this is where all the nitrogen goes when we start this process. From here, glutamate can transfer its amino group to other amino acid precursors. Okay. So here's a list of our, our amino acids on the, the table here. I have a non-essential and an essential list, and I think we talked about this once already. Um, everybody agrees where to put 19 of the 20. Um, everybody also disagrees on where to put tyrosine. If you put tyrosine on the, the left-hand side, the non-essential, it means you can make it yourself. You don't need to get it in your diet. If you put it on the right-hand side in the essential column, it means you must get tyrosine in your diet. Well, both columns are, or positioning in both columns is true. Depends on your definition of essential. If by essential you mean you can't make it from scratch, right? I can't make it from things like glucose, right? And uh, nitrogen or ammonia and other raw materials then tyrosine belongs in the essential column. If by essential, you mean you can't make it from anything else, well, I can make tyrosine from phenylalanine, assuming I have phenylalanine. Then it goes in the non-essential column. If your reason for putting tyrosine in the essential column is because you like two columns of 10, that's not a good reason. Right? But I agree with either column, just depends on your definition of essential. Right? If you have a supply of phenylalanine, which you, humans cannot make, then you can make tyrosine all day. But if you aren't getting phenylalanine, then you're also not getting tyrosine, and it needs to be in the diet as well. Okay? So we're going to do a reaction where we take the, the glutamate we just made, its amino group, transfer it off of glutamate, and give it to a lot of other precursors right, to make the other amino acids. And that's, all, that's almost how all of them require, acquire their nitrogen. Okay. And that's called a transamination reaction. That's the one we're going to see a, a picture of in just a second. And it requires a cofactor called PLP. It's made from vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine, shown on the top. And all we do is add a phosphate to it, and it makes pyridoxal phosphate, also known as PLP. And it's a critical cofactor used by the enzyme that does this reaction. It's a transaminase reaction. Okay, it's not the only one. There are many PLP-dependent transaminases and most of them are involving amino acids. Okay. We also need to move around some one carbon units, so a brief rundown of some vitamins you need here. And so we need folic acid from vitamin, vitamin B9 in our diet. For a lot of these amino acids, we also need to move one carbon units on and off to it. Right? So we need tetrahydrofolate, which is derived from folic acid in our diet as well. And this is so important early on in, in the stages of development, in the first few weeks of development of a, a new human that you need to make all these amino acids. You need to make a lot of things. The cells have to differentiate. So you must have tetrahydrofolate in order to do that or the cells just don't survive. So that's why it's so important. A lot of physicians will recommend anyone of childbearing age should take folic acid supplements. Right? No matter if you plan to be pregnant or not because by the time you know it, you're past the stage where the folic acid was critical. Okay, so here's that transamination reaction I'm talking about. All we're doing is taking one amino acid and one alpha keto acid. Right? The word alpha keto, you know what it means. So for instance here, we have a, a alpha ketoglutarate. Right? So it has a carbon chain right, with a carboxyl group and an alpha keto group. The rest of the tail really doesn't matter that much. Right? So we're going to use one that has to have, happens to have five carbons. So we have this one, alpha ketoglutarate. Here's our, our carbonyl. We also have an amino acid, like aspartate, right? It could have been glutamate. It could have been any other amino acid. It doesn't matter. Well, not anyone, but most of them. But we just chose aspartate for this picture. And what I'm going to do is turn the alpha keto acid, right, sitting right here, into an amino acid, and turn the amino acid into an alpha keto acid. I'm simply swapping two things, the carbonyl, is losing its oxygen and gaining the nitrogen, so this becomes an amino group, and the amino group is leaving and gaining the carbonyl to become, gaining the oxygen to become a carbonyl. Of course, the hydrogen goes along with it. Right? This is not a simple reaction, 
And on the next slide of the previous version of this PowerPoint, if you still have the previous version, you can skip to the next slide and see the mechanism if you'd like, but we're not going to cover it in lecture. But all we're doing is exchanging a carbonyl for a nitrogen. Okay, there's a water molecule loss along the way. That's where the oxygen goes. But it's, it's kind of a two-part two or two-step reaction or two-mode reaction. You have your alpha ketoglutarate is going to lose its oxygen as water, gain the amino group, and then the carbon that just lost the amino group is going to regain a carbonyl from another water molecule. And then the whole thing just can go backwards as well. It's completely reversible. So I'm always exchanging one alpha keto acid and one amino acid for a second pair of alpha keto acids and amino acids. Okay, so if you take alpha ketoglutarate, replace its carbon oxygen with an amino group, you get glutamate. If I take oxaloacetate and replace its carbonyl oxygen with an amino group, you get aspartate. What would I get if I started with pyruvate, one of our other intermediary molecules in metabolism, and replace its carbonyl with an amino group? What would pyruvate become? So remember what pyruvate looks like. The bottom of the slide here shows a picture of oxaloacetate, which is pyruvate plus one more carbon. So if you ignore the top carboxyl group, that is a pyruvate. And if you replaced its carbonyl with an amino group, you would get this molecule at the top, which is aspartate, minus its carboxyl group at the top. What amino acid would that be? Flashing. Not glycine. Glycine only has two carbons. This has three. Alanine? It'd be alanine, exactly. So lots of intermediary mo molecules in metabolism, like pyruvate, oxaloacetate, aspartate, alpha-ketoglutarate, a lot of these have corresponding amino acids. Right? So that's why we have all these amino acids, because they directly correspond to a lot of molecules in intermediary metabolism. That's why they are the ones we have. So all of what you learned about amino acid synthesis is that's how the amino groups get on there. And I want you to know which family the amino acids come from. There are six families. Right? And they're easy to break down by how many carbons they have, basically, or what features they have. So I want you to know that all of these amino acids, all 21 you see here, I'm including selenocysteine here, all 21 come from only six precursors. And if we look at our list of precursors, you see where they come from. Alpha ketoglutarate, that's in the citric acid cycle. We have 3 phosphoglycerate, that's in glycolysis. We have pyruvate, that's in glycolysis. We have oxaloacetate, that's in citric acid cycle. We have phosphoenyl pyruvate, again, that's in glycolysis. And erythrose 4 phosphate. Where did we see erythrose 4 phosphate? I remember when we were moving things around, we had some weird carbon sugars with 7 carbons and 4 carbons and 3 carbons and 6 carbons. That's when we're doing our pentose phosphate pathway. That's how we get the erythrose 4 phosphate from plants. Right? And that's why if you look underneath it, the ones made from that, all the aromatic ones, are required in human diet because we can't make those. Why can't we make those? Well, generally because we don't do photosynthesis. Right? We don't have to do that phosphate shunt. But plants do, so they make all their amino acids. So that makes sense that all those are grouped together. All the aromatics are in one group. And on the far right is the lone group all by himself, the histidine group, is made from ribose 5-phosphate. Once again, it's also in that pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, so all these precursors come from just a few pathways in our metabolism. And you can see how they're made. If you count the number of carbons, count the number of carboxyl groups, these have groupings that should make sense. I don't want you to memorize all the mechanisms of how to make them. That would be for another course. But know where they come from. And of course, up here, cysteine and serine and selenocysteine should all make sense that they come from the same source. They all look alike. They're just replacing an oxygen for a sulfur for a selenium. Okay. So know which categories these come from, know which ones are in each family, and they're kind of evenly spread here except histidine all by itself, right? but know where they come from. And their amino groups clearly come from N2, a molecular nitrogen. Right. The last thing I want you to know about amino acids is the opposite. 
not just their synthesis, but what happens when we need to degrade them? What can we do with them? Well, we had six families here that we can make amino acids from. We had lots of molecules here to make them. But when we degrade them into what do they become? And again, there's only six products. It's not the same six, but there are six products that we make. Some texts will tell you seven because they include um, acetoacetyl-CoA in that group, and I wanted to make it simple for you because acetoacetyl-CoA, it just becomes acetyl-CoA as well. So I grouped all those into the acetyl-CoA category. You notice these are separated in the, in the drawing here, right? But I want you to remember six because it makes more sense because they come from six. We can degrade into six. And I want you to know they degrade into two things. I, well, six things, but essentially two things. If I degrade all these molecules into my six products, look at the box six products. There's pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, oxaloacetate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, and fumarate, right? Five of the six are in the citric acid cycle, and only one is not, pyruvate. But from all of those molecules, right, could you make glucose from them? Is that true? I could make glucose from all six of those box, box molecules, true or false? Here's glucose right here on the drawing. Can I get to glucose from those six red box molecules? Yes. From every one of them. There should be one exception. Which of those six cannot be turned into glucose? We talked about this during our uh, fatty acid degradation pathway. Remember, acetyl-CoA cannot be turned into glucose, not net. Right? There's no way to turn acetyl-CoA, a pair of them, or three of them, into glucose molecules. Not happening. That's why we turned them into ketone bodies instead. So you say, what about oxaloacetate there? Well, oxaloacetate could be made from pyruvate, but you must have a pyruvate to make it. You can't make oxaloacetate from acetyl-CoA without already having an oxaloacetate. So acetyl-CoA cannot be turned into glucose, right? That's our rule, at least not by humans. Um, plant seeds are the only ones who can do it, but we'll leave that for a different course. So of all these amino acids, of our 20 amino acids in the list here, only two have all, their only degradation product is acetyl-CoA, and that's leucine and lysine. So we call those strictly ketogenic. They can never be made into glucose. They can only be turned into ketone bodies or fats. Right? You can never turn leucine and lysine into glucose. The other 18 amino acids we could turn into glucose. Right? And in fact, some of them we could go either way. We could turn into glucose or we can turn into fats. Right? So that's, there's five of those. Right? So make sure you know which ones they are. They're listed in blue on this slide. You notice some molecules occur in multiple places. When you break down threonine, you get multiple products. Right? Or isoleucine. Or your aromatics. So think about which ones and where they go. Uh, leucine and lysine are strictly ketogenic. Right? The three aromatics plus threonine and isoleucine are the ones that are both glucogenic and ketogenic. Right? And all the others are strictly glucogenic. They make only things that can be turned into glucose. Right? Look at all the green stuff there. None of them go into acetyl-CoA. Right? So know those differences among the amino acids, what they're made from, our six categories, and what they break down into there are six target molecules they turn into. Two of your amino acids are strictly ketogenic, leucine and lysine. Five of them could go either way, form glucose or acetyl-CoA, and that's your three aromatics and the isoleucine and threonine. And then the others, all the other green ones you see there, are strictly glucogen. 